Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope so. I'd like to welcome you to the Red Bud chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Um, we have a wonderful program this evening. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the Red Bud chapter um, and then introduce our speakers and we'll get to go on to the program. Um, Red Bud was established more than 25 years ago. Um, we are one of 35 chapters of the California Native Plant Society and serve Western Placer and Nevada County. Our counties are home to an amazing diversity of native flora. Almost a third of California plant species are native to our counties. Of those, more than 750 of our local native wildflowers, trees, and shrubs are described in two guides that were researched and published by members of the Red Bud chapter. Together, Red Bud's more than 300 members learn about, grow, and protect our native plants through field trips and presentations like this one, through growing and propagating native plants and selling them at our sales, um, discovering new plants, and taking action to protect our botanical heritage um, by commenting on uh, environmental interest, impact reports, and so on. We hope that you'll be able to join our um, to join our efforts to attend virtual programs like this one, to check out our many right now online field trips, but hopefully soon we'll be able to start having many outdoor field trips um, in um, together again. Um, we uh, invite you to join our Facebook group, um, which is a good way of being able to communicate with each other and with us and find out about what we're up to. Um, we have several active committees, such as our education committee, our membership committee, um, and our conservation advocacy committee, which submitted comments on eight different projects this last year um, and spoke at several uh, city council and board of supervisors meetings. Uh, we would love to have some of you volunteer to help with our upcoming Redbud online plant sale, and there'll be more information about that in our newsletter. And we also are looking for um, some folks who are interested in being um, involved as an officer or committee chair. We right now need a new treasurer as well as a program chair who would be in charge of organizing programs like the one we're having tonight, and a volunteer chair who would help with organizing volunteers for our various events. So um, I am pleased to be able to present, uh, introduce to you um, Matt and Rachel Berry. Um, Matt teaches ethnobotany. Um, he is currently working for the U.S. Forest Service as a seasonal botanist, and um, we're pleased to have him here. His wife, Rachel, is a passionate herbalist and teaches wildcraft. And again, we're also very thrilled to have her here. So I will turn that over to you and you can share your screen. Hi everyone, it's uh, great to be here. We're just gonna do a little screen sharing here. Give us a moment. There we go. Um, <laughs> we're really excited to be here. We're grateful for everyone at the Red Bud chapter for organizing this um, and for all of you for coming and um, being able to talk about plants when it's harder to be together outside. Um, I'd also like to thank um, all of our teachers. You know, we've been mm -hmm. doing this stuff for many years and I've had a lot of teachers along the way. We see a lot of friends um, who have joined us and many of you have been teachers to us too. So um, we're looking forward to this time together to just talk about plants. Yay, go plants. Woohoo! excited to be here. All right. So uh, like the first question I always get is like, well, what, what got you into like this wildcrafting thing? And 
And this is an old photo here. My twin brother and I doing survival skills in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, and that's when I, you know, even when I was a kid, I was talking to plants, but, you know, I really was into the edibles and all this, you know, being, you know, connected to nature, really. That's what it's all about for me. And I somehow managed to become, you know, uh, a botanist with the Forest Service and also going back to grad school to study meadow restoration. And I still feel like, oh, I just really want to work outdoors. And the more I'm out there, the more I feel like at home. So very lucky. <laughs> And um, I got interested in this work. Um, I've always been really interested in health and healing. Whoops, we're having a little technical issue. Hold on tight. There we go. Um, I've always been really interested in health and healing and how people through their own actions can become healthier. And so when I met Matt and he was doing all his survival skills, two things happened. Uh, once my inner cave woman was like, wow, <laughs> this guy can take care of the situation, whatever comes. Um, also, it, it helped me understand that herbs are not just out there to use, that we can be in relationship with plants and we can be in mutually beneficial relationships with plants. And even before the plant medicine takes effect, just to have that relationship and have that awareness, I believe is really healing and really connects, it connects me deeper to something deeper in my soul, which I think is, uh, improves my quality of life and contributes to the healthier being as well. So that's why I'm really passionate about this work. <laughs> there we go. All right, well, we'll jump into some of the, uh, the stuff that I'm really into is the... Oh, whoops. Oh, did we skip something? Yes, I'm going to say one more thing. Um, before we get started on that, a lot of people wonder uh, when we start to talk about wild crafting and foraging, um, is this realistic? Is this sustainable in today's world? You know, we've all heard about examples of uh, wild plant stands being decimated by people who are collecting them. And so... Um, I think these are really important questions for us to ask ourselves. Uh, do we have enough natural resources to support wild crafting? Do we have enough knowledge about how these plants work within their relationship to their ecosystem to be able to do this sustainably? And um, what about the rare and endangered species? So um, these are all questions uh, that are important and that we want to, at least in part, address tonight. Yes, and getting back into this slide. So one of the ways, you know, tending the wild happened for many, many centuries was, of course, well, over in Australia and over in, in much of California was, you know, a lot of fire was used to, to obviously, you know, maintain the landscape and have a lot of abundance of food plants. And, you know, right here, you can see there's actually a woman leading these fires. So it's, it was a, there was a lot going on. And I, I, uh, I like the term, uh, Pyrodiversity brings biodiversity. So all types of different fires were going on in the spring, in the summer, all kinds of, you know, different techniques and, and when to do it for certain foods. So it was really, really happening. And obviously we're seeing the effects of that right now with all the catastrophic fires, unfortunately. So I think we're really listening to the elders and to the people that, you know, have this knowledge about maintaining and stewarding the landscape. And of course, here's a, here's a, a good example of this is a fire years ago over by um, Shasta Lake, and it's just showing you, you know, the abundance of what can happen after the rejuvenation. Yes, and sometimes it is catastrophic, but in most cases, you know, nature regenerates and is resilient. So hopefully that'll that'll happen more often, and, and we'll do the, the the prescribed fire, the the cultural burns, and all these things will happen so we could not have these catastrophic fires. Right, and the idea of burning and the idea that um... People are in relationship with nature. It's not just a conservation easement that we don't touch. Um, when we do things like fire or certain ways we collect plants, certain times we collect plants, um, sometimes the amounts we collect plants, this is all part of a relationship that can be used to bring more diversity and to bring more health to the environment. Um, and so a question, um, 
some more questions that we hold um, with all this is, you know, there's some great books like Tending the Wild that really outline um, a lot of the native people in California and some of the techniques they used. Um, for us today in modern culture in our bioregion, you know, what does this look like to forage in a way where you're participat participating in nature in a mutually beneficial relationship? And um, for many years, what uh, Matt and I did is we put on a, a wild food and medicine CSA. Um, we borrowed that term instead of community supported agriculture we claimed it community supported awareness so we can be aware of what are these plants that would be appropriate for foraging in today's world and today's environment and so for several years in the fall and the spring seasons um, what we would do is we would go out and we would collect what we believed you know fell in this category and then we would get together with the participants and rather than them just picking it up we would actually teach them you know why did we pick this um, what do you do with it? How do you identify it? Um, how do you make it into food medicine? Yep, and here's one of our uh, our classes where, like she was saying, it was so exciting to get your hands deep into the into the plants, how to process them, learning more about them, and having a group environment, which you know, unlike COVID, well, you know, it might happen soon enough, but um, you know, it's so much fun. I love doing hands-on stuff and getting people outside too to show them what what the plant is as a botanist. So loads of fun. And we learned a lot too, so much. We learned about our community. We learned about where the, where like spots were to get this or that that was in abundance. Someone has this on their land, um, you know, or maybe questions about stewardship. So really, really fun. fun yeah, and keeping our eyes on different patches of plants season after season, year after year. What happened when we did collect? What happened when we didn't? Yeah. And um, here's another example of one of our distributions. Um, Quickly, I'll run through uh, their acorns. There's a variety of flowers, uh, morel mushrooms. Actually, I think that was pine nuts. But okay. Oh, gosh. All right. I'm sorry. That was pine nuts. <laughs> um, plantain and chickweed. And so it was really fun to be able to share the beauty of all this as well. Um, here's another distribution. Again, it really built our relationship with these plants for uh, appreciating them and learning about how they grow. And um, our first plant that we want to talk about is manzanita, because one of the guiding principles um, for foraging is follow the abundance. Um, it's hard to think of other plants that are quite as abundant than manzanita here in our community. And in part because, you know, what Matt was saying, um, we haven't had the kind of fire management that traditional people um, were using to tend the land. So we've got a lot more manzanita. And um, you can collect the berries and the leaves of manzanita without you know, really taking from it long term, right? And I'm sure many of you have tried the manzanita berries. Um, they're high in vitamin C. They've got a nice kind of sweet taste to them. And um, next slide. This is a shot you'll see in just a second as it switches. Um, if you put the berries in a blender and kind of lightly blend them, then it breaks the seed from the rest of the powdery berry. And then you can sift it and you can see in the bowl there that's what people call manzanita sugar. And you can use that to put on oatmeal, you can use it for baking, do all kinds of things with it. It's delicious, great source of vitamin C. Natural sweetener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and this is Rachel a while back uh, picking some Doug fir tips. And uh, you know, this is like a, another example of an abundant plant that might need some, you know, a little bit of like deer browsing, but people browsing and, you know, maybe getting areas that are growing out too thick and so that the plants are more evenly distributed, doing a little, you know, natural thinning. And you can see here the, the spring growth. And usually in our area, these plants are in more of deep canyons and a little cooler on the north side, um, but heavily abundant. And here's the new growth. You can see it's much bright green and high in vitamin C again, really good tea or even a, a, a nibble on the trail. This one I'm sure many of you recognize and probably many of you have feasted on. Um, this is minor lettuce. Um, this is a great spring green for a number of reasons. Um, it's early in the season and um, you know, it's easy to cultivate, relatively easy to cultivate a patch of this in your own yard. Um, it grows 
super abundantly in many places, needs a little moisture. And um, the greens are so delicious and they're so tender yeah. and they don't get bitter yeah. and Unlike you don't have to prep it. You don't have to process it. All you need to do is take it from a place um, where you're, you've got some certainty that it's clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And usually it's under the oaks, which is great. And then another strategy too is you could even gather some of the ones that say they're going to seed they're about ready to like, but they're not like sprung out. You could even put all that in a brown bag and save that and then put those seeds in your garden or somewhere. And then hopefully, you know, maybe you put those out in the fall and in the spring, you might have a bunch of miners like mm -hmm. Yeah, when our daughter was little, maybe five and six, we just found some pictures where we're making little tacos with the really big leaves and putting food in there. It's just a fun thing to do. Yeah, and there are, there are several varieties, but this is the regular garden variety. And then another abundant plant, one of my favorites, it's got so many uses, uh, um, cattails. And right here is shown is uh, what we call the cattail hearts. And the white part at the base there, you know, you pull that out of the main thing of the, of the cattail stalk there uh, in the spring. And you, know, you could cut this up. Oh, where'd that go? Shot of it. Anyway, all right. Well, anyway, maybe that's later on. Um, but basically, yeah, these are really good in salad, raw. Um, and you just got to be careful not to eat the green part. And, um, and then the other edible part is, well, there's actually, you could eat the root. Um, and you could, of course, weave with the, with, the, with the leaves. It's such an abundant plant. You could, you know, do so many things with the fluff. But now this is the pollen. And then you could, you, you could, you could gather the pollen. And then, um, well, here's a bunch of it right here we gathered. And this is excellent as an additive to, like, in baking dishes like pancakes, that's one of my favorites. It is kind of, and highly nutritional. But it's a little harder to store, so you got to eat it up. I mean, people like maybe put it in jars and freeze it. So Matt, there's a question: um, Is it true that it shouldn't you shouldn't eat it after it flowers? Uh, yeah, it usually becomes too bitter. You can actually do a young top cattail stock when it's in what they call the corn on the cob stage. So it's like it's still in a sheath, and then you could like actually boil those a little bit and it tastes kind of like similar to corn on the cob for real but then once it gets older yeah it's, it's gone to seed and it's no longer and then it's good for tinder or making um actually earthen plastics <laughs> i see a few other comments um somebody said it's hard to hear can we stick closer to the mic yes we will speak up and uh please let us know if it this doesn't work um matt matt and rachel i think the question about the flowers was about the miner's letter oh got it thanks Oh, thanks. Uh, well, miner's lettuce, you could eat the whole thing. The only thing that I would be careful of is making sure there's no little tiny spiders or bugs in there. Because <laughs> I've done that extra protein, but you know. And but also, it's, but it's okay to eat it even if it started oh, yeah. to flower? Yep. And also, I see that we have a comment um, where somebody shared um, one of the, um, let's see. The name for miner's lettuce in the Ohlone language, um, which I don't want to pronounce and slaughter. <laughs> um, but it's a good point that that could be thought of as Indian lettuce um, instead of miner's lettuce. Yeah, it would be a more appropriate name for it. Or I've heard someone call it fairy lettuce. So, okay. <laughs> um, one other thing I want to mention before we get off um, from cattails is um, when you're foraging, you really have to think about where these plants are growing. Um, we no longer live in a pristine wilderness, um, especially here in the Sierra foothills. We know there's been a lot of mining. Um, there's a lot of heavy metals and um, cattails are one of the plants that fall in the category of biodynamic accumulators. And so um, they're great cleaners. Um, they're often used um, to clean up uh, dirty water, um, to for bio re remediation. Mm -hmm. And so if you're gonna harvest these plants, you really have to think about, well, where is their water source? You know, what has happened around this? And um, think about that before you do consume them. Thank you. And also another tidbit on common names versus, um, you know, the Latin names. Generally, we like to use just common names because it's more easy, but, um, there are resources out there, of course, and I might, you know, if you, I might save some of the Latin names like some other species, like this one right here. So this is another actually pretty abundant plant, believe it or not. Um, this is called Yampa, and it's a member of the Apiaceae or carrot family. 
And uh, this is Pertigeria uh, kalagii, a uh, really abundant one. And I just wanted to share this one because this was one of the abundant foods around here for you know the native peoples all the way here to the you know western all the western states. And um, and it was because of this big tuber that was at the base of it. And starchy thing, it was like little potatoes, you know, really, really yummy. Um, the interesting thing about this particular species is when you try and, you know, pull, just pull the plant out, it'll just become disjunct right from that stem off the tuber. So the tuber is like saved. Um, and then some species have actually no tubers or very few and more of a fibrous root system. So you'll be like, oh, I can't pull that one up. So you know, if you have this one, if you pull it up and you get nothing. And then there's a proper way to actually harvest this. Uh, Farrell Cunningham, a mentor of mine who passed away a while back, he, he was at, you know, Mighty Indian Chayakam, and um, he basically was like, okay, in the fall, when you gather it, and you go after the rain, like the first rain, so it's a, the ground's a little looser, and then you get your digging stick, you get the tubers, and then the hole that you have, you actually put the ripe seed back into the hole, and so you're, you're, you're replicating, you know, another, you know, you're just making more plants basically they need that actually they like that disturbance and then you leave some of the baby little corns or little tubers also so it's, it can be really abundant in the field um such as this one did you want to okay. mention yeah and this is like again like a meadow that had fire on it like two or three years previous and you know this was just this is all abundant yampa right here all the all these white flowers and it's just you know so happy to see and you know back Back in the day, they would like actually probably burn this on a regular basis. And it's similar like to like blue camas, which is another big food source as a sweetener. Um, but basically, you know, really, really important food sources. I mean, these were just as good as like acorns in some places. So uh, a lot of work, but also a lot of tending. Um, there's a request to spell this plant's name. And I'm going to do that and put the Latin name in here, in here for you. Whoops. Yeah, and in, in another story too about Yampa and other bulb plants, there was an area, I can't remember where exactly, in the, in the Rockies, where the native people were kicked out of it, and it was a national park or something, and, and these plants uh, started not to thrive anymore, and actually they went into like, you know, a threatened space, space because there was no longer tending going on, and it was just a sad thing, because like, oh, people are like, oh, they were so conserv conservative about the land that they forgot that, that there's an interaction with, you know, people and the plants that, that have to happen. So you get that in mind? Um, I got it to one person, but I'm trying to get it to everybody else. Okay. Um, there we go. Um, so just, I think in summary, um, I think a, a concept we really want to highlight here is, you know, Yampa is something that was a staple food um, for native people who knew its relationship within its ecological um, home. And so for us as modern day foragers, unless we are super clear about that relationship and um, how to, it can be mutually beneficial, and unless we are super clear on how to identify it, especially when it's in the carrot family, um, this is not something that we would want to forage on our own. And it's also another you know, experiment you can do, like a Brock Dolman at the Arts and Ecology Center there, the Occidental, um, they, they've, they've got a whole thing on their website. I think they even had an article in the Fermanti about it, where they are growing out all these different Yampa varieties on their own and seeing how they're doing there. Now they have a whole field of it. So that's another thing to do is, you know, maybe gather some seed where it's locally abundant, you know, and start planting it. And also another one more thing about this plant, it's wild caraway, the seed. So uh, really neat plant. All right. Um, who wants one of these? <laughs> um, and oh, we have a question oh, about okay. the Yampa before we go on. Oh, no. Uh, so Queen Anne's Lace, that's, that's like a DACA, that's a wild parrot. Um, similar family, APAC, but not, not what we're calling our, our native um, Yampa. So a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, the Queen, Queen Anne's Lace will have a, a, a taproot rather than the... Yeah, and tumor. it'll be hairy and it also have a red flower right in the center when it's mature. So, and it's along the roadside a lot too, though. So, but yeah. All right. Um, so a super abundant plant that we have, especially in our river canyons, are grape leaves. 
And so that's something we can easily harvest. Um, this is a, a dish we made for our CSA class um, where we took the grape leaves. You can really find those nice big ones, um, dip them in a salty brine, and then you can actually make dolmas out of them. And they are garnished here with black locust flowers. And for those of you who have smelled the beautiful scent, sort of vanilla-y um, scent of these flowers, you know that that's a treat. And um, those locust flowers are super abundant. They're typically really high up in the sky. There's not a whole lot that we can gather ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a nice thing to gather and play with as a food as well. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because now we're getting into, I think, more of the non-native plants Right, or maybe after this, or maybe maybe not quite yet. But but what's interesting is that like, I think by, I think my love for native plants is like, oh, let's share the abundance of all these other plants that were brought here anyway. Because you know the black locust was brought mainly for the fence posts because uh, they stay forever. But they're you know they like to get around, so <laughs> we're picking some of the seeds. <laughs> okay, here's my one of my favorite foods and staples: acorns. Um, probably everyone's got, we have, we, I just got an email about like, oh, are they dropping already? Yeah, there's like three different drops. So there's an early and a regular drop and then a late drop. But anyway, um, I could go on. We, we do full workshops on actually how to process acorns. So we'll just have a, a little tidbit on how to, you know, what to do with this abundant food source. You know, it's an awesome source of carbohydrates and protein. Um, and uh, go on here. And um, so the first little thing here is like cracking them and this is the you know the old style way with a with either a bedrock mortar or a, or a mobile mortar with a, with a pestle there and um you know the, the you know you'll see the bedrock mortars around here and the women were mostly doing that with their big 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 pounders when in, in a rhythm all day long making all that awesome acorn meal and then then you grind and then today we grind them up in a blender and then we do anyway <laughs> hey, some of those uh native folks i know still do that today today uh, much easier, but yeah. So then, you know, you you basically put them in this water and uh, and then you leach them because they have uh, a lot of tannic acid that actually, you know, preserve the acorn, which is a good thing. Um, like certain species like valley oaks, they, they have very little tannins and so they'll go quicker and the squirrels will eat them quicker, but then they'll also go bad quicker. So the, tan the tannins are heavy in the, you know, the black oak, which was, you know, heavily around here. Anyway, and then you just wait for this water to clear out and then you, you have your, uh, the acorn meal and you could do you know acorn pizzas or whatever there's some resources we have for to have some great recipes and um if anybody hasn't yet had the opportunity to eat some acorn um i hope you do i hope you you know there are different uh lots of resources and we have a resource list um as a pdf i believe attached to this uh presentation um so you can learn more about it but we've really enjoyed uh, making the acorn right after I gave birth to our daughter. Matt fed me acorn and eggs, which is awesome. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a com it is a truly complete food. And so when yeah. we think about getting all these expensive, you know, superfoods from the equator, it's like, oh my gosh, here's this huge abundant source of total complete food all around us. And so these balls here are something that we like to do. It's, uh, we use mostly the acorn flour once it's been leached. And there's, then there's some manzanita sugar in there. Um, there's a little bit of salt and um, a little bit of oil, like ghee or coconut oil to help bring it all together. And uh, it's, it's a fun, beautiful, nutritious thing to do. This is our, one of our local herbalists, Margot, some of you may know. Um, and she's there hugging the, the elder tree. Um, the elder has gotten a lot of publicity um, in the medicine, uh, herbal medicine world. Um, she's here cuddling with the flowers. And uh, the flowers are great for um, fever, you know, especially now when we're talking about, you know, coming up on cold and flu season and then with everything happening with COVID. Um, uh, herbal treatment of fevers is a little different. You know, when you take something like Tylenol or ibuprofen, that pushes down the fever response. Um, the fever response is actually healthy to help kill off bacteria. And so uh, plants like elderflowers um, can help your body move through the fever um, more comfortably, more quickly to promote sweating. 
Um, so you can get the benefits of the fever, but you can get through it a little easier. And so um, Margot makes skincare, and so do I. Herbal skincare, elderflower has been used all over the world for skincare. We put it in lotions and different things. And um, the elder tree is so large, again, unless you're really up there with um, a very big ladder, ladder or a um, or like a bucket uh, construction uh, machinery, um, you, you can't pick them all. And there's going to be stuff up on the top for the birds because they like to eat them too. And then, of course, after the flowers come the elderberries. And pretty much everybody these days has heard of elderberry syrup. Um, it's something that we make every season and try to make lots of to last us through. And um, a lot of people are taking this for cold and flu, flu pre prevention and treatment. Um, it's been found active against 14 different strains of flu. Um, they believe it's also active. There's research to suggest that it's also active against COVID. Um, so it's, and it tastes delicious. Um, it's got such a unique flavor. Um, so that's a fun one um, to get in your backyard and to plant and um, to harvest where it's appropriate. Yeah, and then just one more thing on gathering. So I was just recently out on the Sequoia National Forest after four years of a fire, like, you know, after four years after a fire, and there were so many elderberry bushes along this dirt road. I was like, oh my God, like there's three pounds. There's five, you know, I, I just got a little bit, but it, it was, it's so abundant. And then also another trick is when you do gather all these berries is like, okay, you got to separate the berry from the stem because the stem is, you know, slightly toxic, but not going to kill you, but it's good to separate it. So what you do is you freeze them all and then, you know, you get a bunch of them and then you, and then you take them out of the freezer and they separate a little easier you know, mm -hmm. and you can make your elderberry wine or whatever. It's a great trick. It makes it, makes it much easier. And just a note, if you're making this out there and you don't already know, um, some of us um, will have an emetic response to raw elderberry, which means we will throw up. Um, it's a small part of the population. Um, if you don't want to find out if that's you, always cook your elderberries first. Or dry them, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, anyway, hopefully you guys can see this one. But this is a, a plant called Wapato or Arrowhead. Or, yeah, arrow, yeah Arrowhead. And, um, and it's a pond plant that's actually native, the Sagittarius latifolius. And we could spell that out if you want. Um, anyway, um, and um, a very abundant plant. And you know, if you have a pond, it's one to plant. Okay, this is an approximation of the Latin name here on the fly. Great and uh, a yeah, super abundant pond plant. And so at the base of the plant, there's actually these little tubers that when you go into a pond situation, you go in and you kind of start mucking it up. In fact, I have a video somewhere of me doing it. And uh, these will start to pop up. And these are like little um, starchy potatoes, similar to the yampa. And, um, and you know, the natives around here would definitely have these, you know, as part of a staple crop but once again. Um, and then once you're done, then you kind of like scrape off the outer, outer uh, skin there and then cook them up like you could slice them up and put them in the oven with olive oil or whatever. They're really yummy. And they're high in inulin also, which is another thing that's like, I guess, popular now for digestion and gut flora. Good for gut health. Yeah. So, Prebiotic, I believe. Yeah. Pretty neat plant. So these, I think these are even sold at some of the pond stores too. So. And that's another thing that we're excited about doing for people is you know at one point i wanted to, i want to start a native nursery so people could buy the plants after they take our class you know so they could just start planting more but a lot of these places have them so excited about you know getting more native plants out there in your garden so that brings us to mushrooms um we have an amazing resource in our community with a annual fungus foray and um, the great thing about harvesting mushrooms is, you know, when you're harvesting the part you eat, you're harvesting the fruiting body. And so you're leaving all the mycelium down on the ground so you aren't, actually, you aren't depleting any resources by collecting. Yeah, and this is like some cold weather. Uh, these are matsutakis that, I mean, you guys probably know where they grow, but I'm not gonna tell you my spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mara found these. We were pretty lucky there. You could tell she's excited. but. You know, it's it's all about the abundance too, and what like she said, like you're just, you're just getting the fruiting body. But you know, there is something to say about leaving some for the squirrels and all the other animals too. 
So there is, and that's another thing I don't know if we brought up about like going to a certain stand of plants or mushrooms, like only taking a certain percentage, right? Like maybe even 10%. Um, there are sure. guidelines out yeah. there that say, you know, don't take more than 10%, but I think it's, it's you know, it's all contextual, you know, yeah. over um, like on Bowman Lake Road, there are a lot of elder plants around there, a lot of elder trees, and I know a whole lot of people who pick there. And so the first person takes 10%, the second person takes 10%, the next person takes 10%, you know, I think it's, there's no easy, hard and fast rules in all this. That's why it's really building relationships, building knowledge, and starting with what is super abundant, starting what with what has a super wide safety margin. Yeah, and the, the Yuba, Yuba foray is amazing. It's been out for 20 years, so it's an amazing resource. It's, you can really learn a lot from all the experts there. Right. And uh, turkey tail, isn't this beautiful? Um, turkey tail is another one that's been uh, more popular recently because it does enhance our immune system's ability to fight off illness and disease. And so um, we like to collect these and dry them and then I'll throw them in um, broths or when I'm cooking a grain to get some of that goodness out. Um, there's also some interesting research about turkey tail being used specifically to fight breast cancer. So these are really powerful plants that um, again, these plants that we're talking about here have a really wide safety margin. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say one thing as we, we are going to move away from native plants and move next towards um, our weedy friends. Um, this is an example of Trillium, a beautiful native that we have here um, in our area. And um, I was taught by um, Kathy Keeville that these roots on these plants grow so slowly that when they're 70 years old, they're about that big, you know. Um, and so Trillium is used um, traditionally uh, to help women in labor, um, which is interesting and can be helpful, but we have a whole lot of other plants that can do that. And unless you're cultivating your own uh, stand, this would not be one you'd ever wanna consider wild harvesting. Um, so again, I just wanna stress that, you know, approaching foraging, it's a lot of questions and it's all contextual. And so we really have to be well educated. Yeah. And um, we've got some. Oh, Thea is saying that turkey tail is a Trimedi versicolor and that there are no other lookalikes. And none are, I mean, there, there are lookalikes, but none are dangerous. I think there's an orange bottom one that's like, yeah, another name. This is our, Thea is my actually co worker and she's a mycologist. So. Thank you, Thea, for yeah. mentioning that. Good yeah. point. Yeah, fall, yeah, you could, eat, you could do both. <laughs> okay, should we get weedy? Let's get weedy. All right, some uh, some chickweed. Now, some of this, some of the you know members of this Delaria family are actually native up in the more of the mountains. I see them all the time on my meadow work. But this one here is a garden variety that's kind of uh, you know gets around. Um, it's not native, but it's delicious. <laughs> and it's kind of like the three sisters of spring. This, and then you have uh, there's a gallium, the bed straw, or the cleavers, uh, cleavers, and then and then also miner's bud. So that's the three spring queens I call them. And, you know, this is like so good, in like a smoothie or on a salad. Once again, it doesn't get real bitter. Um, there is a, a slight look of like the scarlet pimpernel that has a, you know, sort of like scarlet to pink flower. But if you don't have the flower yet, you got to look at the um, hairs on the stem. It's got a single hair. And uh, too bad I'm not in person here to do this, but it's also got like a little bungee cord in it. The uh, miners like it, or the chickweed does. Anyway, awesome plant. Um, okay, so another sort of principle when we're thinking about wild foraging, um, especially with weeds, um, is a concept called farming on the edge. Um, when we were doing our CSA, um, we would create relationships with our local organic farmers because they grow the best weeds. <laughs> you know, they've got really beautiful fertile soil and they allow things to grow around. And so here, I think this was um, mountain Bounty Farm many years ago, and we were collecting dandelion for the CSA. And so um, probably everybody has experimented with dandelion. Uh, you can eat the leaves, they're a little bitter, they stimulate digestion. Saute it, don't spray it. That's right, another <laughs> another founding principle. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and so the, the flowers are really sweet. We make uh, flower fritters every season in the spring, and um, next slide is coming, uh, the roots. 
Um, the root is fabulous. Again, this is a biodynamic uh, accumulator. You want to be thoughtful where you're collecting this um, because it part of its job as a weed is to collect the you know what's lower in the soil and to bring it up to the surface to allow more plants to um, succeed it afterwards. Um, the root is used widely for liver support. And so there are many of us for many reasons in today's society that need some help detoxifying. And so dandelion is a great choice for that. Yeah, and the leaves are tasty too, especially if, in the early spring when they're a little bitter, but they're good. If you catch them before right. they blossom. Yeah. And yeah. another little fun fact is the stalk of the straw is hollow. And the, the stalk of the flower yeah. is hollow and you can use it as a straw. Cool stuff. Oh, there's your British. There's, um, yeah, this is, these are dandelion oat cakes. And um, we'll share some resources with you later if you're interested in the recipe. Yeah, really yummy stuff, especially if you have kids. <laughs> like, I'm gonna eat that green stuff. Oh, it's much better with flour around it. <laughs> Cattail flour, that is great. Um, so at another abundant plant, um, plantain. There's a couple different varieties we have. There are some native ones that are really small, but this one's uh, you know, non-native. Um, and that is Lanceolata, Plantago Lanceolata. And um, white man's footsteps, I guess it was, you know, has been called. And actually the, the native culture actually embraced this plant. Like, oh, it's a great plant. You know, the seeds are edible. The husk is psyllium. Basically it's really good for your, um, you know, your gut and digestion. And then also, I think the number one thing that, that we use this for at our house, and we have a whole bunch of it out there, um, is, uh, is any kind of bee sting or insect bite. And you could just chew this up into like a poultice and then put it on that bite and we call it the plantain band-aid and you just put a band-aid over there and it sucks out any toxins the poisons or even like you know seeds that are stuck in you or you know with like it's just you know, it's got this, this ability to just pull draw, yeah. which is amazing um you know plantain gets unnoticed and people curse it but this plant has so many uses and is so helpful and um Something I'd like to share with people is, you know, our herbal heritage is still available in CVS. You know, if you go buy a can of Metamucil, what you're buying is the husk off of a, a planting plant. So um, yeah. it works. Uh, this is yarrow and um, there are native varieties and non-native varieties. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call this weedy unless you're talking about you know some of the introduced varieties um, but it's a good one to know about because it's a great first aid plant for stopping bleeding um, and it's something that we should all just keep in mind if we're on the trail or outside um, it's got great powers in that area and um, I wanted to include this slide because it brings up you know when we're starting to um, collect things that like we talked about Yampa, you know, is it, is it Queen Anne's lace or not? You know, and yarrow is actually in the, um, the sunflower family. It's here. Oh, it is? Okay. Oh, yeah. maybe it is. No, 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 no. I there think so, somebody confirmed that for us. I'm pretty no, sure it's, right, it's yeah. in the aster family. But it, it, it could be looking like, it, oh, it it's, it's exactly yeah. it. It looks like the carrot family. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> Matt hates this picture, but I like it. <laughs> Um, because it's like, hey, people, pay attention. You know, um, he's sharing that, you know, if you pick the wrong plant, you could be in serious trouble, you know, especially with the carrot family. So um, we just can't stress that enough. If you're going to explore foraging is make sure you're 110% sure you know what you're dealing with, because otherwise these plants we're talking about, let's say have a really wide safety margin, don't. All right, here's another one that's, it's got the unfortunate name of Malva neglecta, like or it's, mallow. it's neglected. Anyway, it's but I, there's several common names like well, um, well, cheese, cheese weed or cheese wheel is is what's what we're using here. But it's also what um, this mallow what, isn't there some other common names I can't think. Anyway, um, but this thing grows at a side sidewalk. Super abundant, super prolific, super powerful. Uh, you can actually just dry the big leaves. Um, in a dehydrator, not in the sun. That's another little tip, right? Because you don't want to drain all the, the goodies in it and, um, and make a green powder out of it. It's like spirulina on steroids. It's great. And, um, but the fun part about this one is the fruit here. You can see the little cheese wheel. All the mallow families have a similar seed, like hollyhocks and all that. And if you get them green, pick a bunch of them, and then you soak them. And then you could make 
a sort of meringue with this. It's amazing. Or, or even marshmallows. Uh, there's all kinds of recipes out there. I even, I think I added like an egg white and it just started whipping up. It was so much fun. And then we, uh, yeah, I was really excited here as you can see. Um, Matt is so proud because that took so long to do <laughs> with electricity. But, you know, back in the day, it's like, you know, they were using the root, they were using the, the well, immature seeds plant, right? yeah. uh -huh, to make these things as a vehicle for delivering herbal medicine. Yeah, yeah. And then also there's the marshmallow plant that you use the root from and you do the same thing where you kind of boil down a bunch of the seeds together with water and you make the syrup and then the syrup gets whipped up. Yeah, a lot of work. And that's another thing about wildcrafting. You know, I mean, how many people have the time right now to do all this work? I mean, it's, it, it's quite a bit. So, and that's, then, that's where the relationship comes in. Yeah, so much fun. I can't remember what, what what's this recipe again? Is this it, uh, was a dessert that we served at the end of I think our first CSA, and um, it included uh, some of the marshmallow on top, and um, it was a wild custard with some elderberry syrup and elderflowers. So um, there's a lot of fun, you know, there's a lot of fun ways to be creative. Yeah, and there's a lot of good cookbook stuff there too. I see that some of you are chiming in and putting in Latin names. Uh, thank you for sharing that with the group. And um, this guy here, um, St. John's wort. It's a very close up picture. So sometimes it gets confused with the um, landscape plant that's kind of, um, it doesn't have a stiff stalk. It's kind of wavy, right? And it crawls and it covers the ground. Um, St. John's wort um, is a great weed to harvest for a couple reasons. Is number one, a lot of people think it's noxious and they don't want it on their property. So perfect, win-win situation, clear it off for them. Um, I actually cultivate some St. John's wort in my garden and I cut it early in the season. It has a second bloom and then I cut it late in the season. So um, I have a way of kind of maintaining it where I'm, where I'm at. And um, I love using this primarily uh, to make uh, infused oils. I think you have another picture. Yeah, as this, you'll get the, the slide in a second here. Um, this beautiful red oil is just, uh, you know, a basic oil like olive oil that's been infused with the St. John's wort. And uh, the Latin name is Hypericum perforatum. And the hypericin is this active ingredient that creates this redness. And this is beautiful medicine for um, physical injuries. Um, if you've um, got, uh, if you've hurt muscles, strained muscle, especially nerves. If you've got um, a damaged nerves from something like shingles or from some kind of physical injury, um, this can be really great um, for stain for that reason. I always keep a bottle of it and then we put it in our baths and sometimes our daughter, after a hard day, she'll grab the St. John's Wort and put it in the bath and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Lovely stuff. All right, and another abundant plant, you know, I, I think a lot of people that maybe are outside of the zone of knowing plants, you go on the highway and you're like, oh, that pretty, there's that pretty pink one, you know, and it is. I mean, you know, just because it's like fully invasive doesn't mean it's a bad plant. <laughs> it's it has her. a job to yeah. do, right? These plants always have a job Nitrogen to do. Nitrogen fixing, right? Stable, but this one is really abundant. And what we found is, you know, the flowers are edible as most pea flowers are. But the funnest thing is like, I don't know if you remember all the craze about pea tips a while back and these pea tips are really good. You mm -hmm. can do them raw, you can steam them a little bit, um, but they're really abundant too. So mm -hmm. in fact, I've, you know, I've pulled some out of our garden where I don't want them and oh my God, that taproot is like, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go dig to China, you know, and it's really big and long. So they're gonna stick around because they get stored mm -hmm. some energy, but another abundant plant for sure. Mm -hmm. Talk about that? Well, um, we just kind of wanted to take you through some examples of the sort of these bigger concepts that we wanted to share with you tonight. And then just to bring it back home is, you know, it's all about our relationship with the plants and it's all about our relationship with the planet. And um, for us, you know, foraging and the idea of wild crafting has been a great way for us um, to build that relationship ourselves and to share that with our family. Um, because there are, you know, like I said before, there are so many beneficial reasons um, for us individually and collectively as a community um, to be building this know-how. Yeah, and to have it for, you know, seven generations out from us, you know, like these young kids that are in this picture, 
oh, they're pretty young now. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's, that's what we got to leave them something, you know, and maybe we could leave it better than we found it. That's, that's, that's my goal. Mm-hmm. I'm really into restoration and, and planting more and more natives. And on our land, we're going to be, you know, burning some more and getting our, our, our meadow, like all the, you know, non-native grasses, hopefully we'll, in five years after some fires, they'll, they'll hopefully, hopefully just the natives will be here. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and if they're weeds, we'll eat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, that's the end of our formal presentation. And um, oh gosh, yeah, one more slide. Um, so um, let's see. Is it um, Chrissy? Could you confirm that the PDF is available for people to download with resources for learning more? I think Shane might have put it up. Shane, have you put that up? Do you know? If not, we'll have it up by tomorrow. Do you want to? Um, we're just reading the no, comments real quick. That's fine. Do you want to confirm which one that is? It's the same thing. Oh, different common names. Yeah. Right. Okay. Common names. Um, also, um, I've left my website there for people who are interested in the herbal portion. I've got lots of recipes and little tips there for um, how to use weeds and um, local plants for um, medicine and skin care. Um, I do have a class coming up on September 26th if anybody's interested in getting their hands on um, making things like elderberry syrup and um, other potions to help support us during the cold flu season. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, it looks like Christy has put a request. If anybody does have questions, um, we do have a little bit of time to um, create some dialogue. If there's something else that you wanna know about or a point that you wanted to raise. Uh, I'll I'll start the ball I'll start the ball rolling, Matt and Rachel. Uh, you all talked about uh, yarrow being useful for uh, stopping bleeding. Um, how do you how do you do that? Well, you know it's in, it's interesting you say that because the uh, Latin name Achilles millifolia Achilles I think goes back to where Achilles you know his like tendon got cut and he almost bled out and they put yarrow on it. Stop the bleeding. Actually, a little different than that. Oh, the story I, I know. I like that one anyway. <laughs> the story I know is Achilles' mother, because Yara was also thought about a plant of protection, and uh, like ener- energetically. And so his mother, I believe, picked him up by the ankle and dipped him in the yarrow, but she, the yarrow, didn't get his ankle, and so yeah. that's why the Achilles is his weakness. Um, but he did bring it in, legend says, into the battlefields to yeah. help with wounds, and so you can just put it directly on. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who lives super remotely up in Alaska, and he was chopping wood in the middle of winter, hit his wrist, had a huge wound. He did have enough access to yarrow through the snow, put it on his wrist, canoed to town, <laughs> and um, he was okay uh, yeah. for bloody noses. It's you a can just put thing. it up your nose. You know, it's super yeah. um, easy to use. It coagulates the blood. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I think it was used a lot on the war field. In, in mm-hmm. old, old, you know, World War One and two, yeah. Well, that's great. So Natalie has a question there for you. Um, how do you approach the question of bridging leave leave no trace principles with foraging as a positive thing, as in when somebody asks you if it's contradictory? It's not that she believes it is; she's just looking for guidance in that dialogue. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that is a good question. I mean, I remember when I did some stuff uh, on Islay de Tiburon down in the Gulf of Mexico and Baja, and it was with the uh, the local tribe there. And it was interesting because they would like, they would cut, let's say something for firewood or maybe even gather some, I can't remember what it was, but instead of leaving like a, a cut mark, they would like rough it up and like, looks like it's like, you know, not damaged by humans. So it's like leaving no trace, you know? So I think it's all about the skill in which you're going to be doing that and no one's even going to know you were there. I think that's, you know, that's an interesting point. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, I think also, I think um, we're coming to a point, we've got enough, I think, and Matt will know more about this, we have enough scientific data at this point to challenge the idea that the best thing for nature is to leave it alone. Um, there's more and more research coming from, you know, people who held this traditional knowledge that we, when we interact with the plants um, in an informed, intelligent way, we are improving their habitat. We are improving their vitality. You know, it's just like the example of fire. 
And so I think, you know, it's just for so long, we've thought, you know, that's nature, this is us, we don't touch it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I think we just need to challenge that and recognize that we are part of the ecology on this planet. And um, most of us don't have all the skills and knowledge because that's been broken in our lineage from when we were traditional people, but we can work back towards um, reclaiming mm -hmm. that traditional knowledge and being in a relationship in a positive way. And you know, there and another point too to that is that it is it's also hard because you know we live in the country more by choice because we like to go out and maybe you know harvest on our own land even and cultivate more. But you know, people in cities, it's a different story. So right. it really is. There's a finite resource right. there, and there's been several people I know that are there that it's you know it's really hard because they'll get you know basically arrested for harvesting in a park because mm -hmm. that that's there for everybody's use. So yes, I think it really depends on where you're at. Good point. Again, it's all contextual. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what the general, uh, what the uh, what the rules are on where you can and can't uh, forage? Yes. Um, so, I mean, we don't have like the list in front of us or anything, but right now, but basically, uh, you know, state parks are usually off offhand. Um, they have rules around like, you know, like just right down here at Yuba, Yuba, South Yuba, South Yuba State Park, you know, you're not, and then even in areas like we were just in the bristle cones and the White Mountains, you're not even supposed to touch any piece of wood there because those, those plants are, you know, they're kind of a rare species there. So, you know, it all, it really depends on where you are. And, the, and in the national forest, technically, you know, if you're just doing it on your own, that's fine. But if you're doing it for like, say, you know, uh, money or you have a wild crafting business then you have to have a permit so that's that and then private land um unfortunately you could do kind of what you want well with permission and, well well no if you have private oh, land if you're the owner yeah. you can do what you want you but, can do what you want and you know right. some places you know the owner doesn't maybe know what they're doing <laughs> right but sort of our practices when we were doing the csa is we would build relationships with uh, farmers and landowners yeah. so we could harvest you know with their permission and um, you know, there's the next step of getting permits um, yeah. if you want to collect something bigger. But also, it's a lot of just relationship building because some of these plants, like um, Jean wrote in the comments, you know, if we're fo focusing on the invasive species, um, you're going to gather a lot of friends. We're like, yeah, of course, you can come here to to this area and do this. Um, so again, you just have to be careful to really know your plant ID. Like St. John's wort, we have a native variety and it looks different than the invasive. And so you just want to make sure you're really collecting the invasive mm -hmm. and not the native. Yeah, yeah. And that's another point too, that most places, if you're picking, you know, St. John's wort, they're like, go for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, in fact, at one point with the Forest Service, they would talk about doing a, what they call an MOU, uh, Memorandum of Understanding. And, you know, basically, instead of maybe using chemicals, using people as like, hey, we'll get the blackberries, we'll get the other things or whatever else might be out there that's invasive, you know, um, and, you know, like saute it, don't, don't spray it kind of thing. And there are examples, um, there's a great group in Boulder who are doing this, where they've partnered with the city. And instead of spraying their parks, they're collecting the food and they even have a little restaurant where they serve the wild food. And um, they've just been really creative and innovative and how to approach it. Any other questions? I was just looking at that kind of thing. Oh, the book is in the book. What is that restaurant in Boulder? Um, Matt is getting <laughs> information right now. She's got a great book, which is probably on our resource list, but we'll share it with you here to make sure that you can get your hands on it. Turtle, Turtle Island? This is backwards for you, darn it. Okay, it's called Local Wildlife, Turtle Lake Refuge. That's what it's called, Turtle Lake Refuge. And this is a recipe book that um, she has for um, nutritious weeds. Oh, it's not backwards. It's showing up backwards for me, but not for you. <laughs> the magic of Zoom. <laughs> yeah, she's an awesome resource. Yeah, she's probably got some great videos on YouTube if you want to check her out. Anything else? 
All right. Well, um, All right. You, you can reach us through the website. And um, we're happy to hear any questions that you have later on or um, any other feedback that you might have. Yeah. And hopefully, after COVID, I'll be doing some physical tours. I always love to. <laughs> Rachel and Matt, um, this is Jean again. I want to thank you very much for a great presentation. And we do look forward to being able to take your classes and find out more when, when we can do that. Great. All right. Yep. Well, and thank you, everyone, uh, for putting this together. Thank you, Shane, for engineering all the uh, magic that happens online and in this whole YouTube channel. So. Awesome to get more more stuff out there. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks again. Wait, we have one more. Whoops. We uh, Pam Pam um, is going to talk to you for a minute about our um, native plant bingo, red bud treasure hunt bingo, and uh, which is we hope people will join in. It's really fun. So go go Pam. Um, so we actually started the game a few days ago, but you don't have to, it doesn't matter when you, um, when you join, you just need to send an email to redbudchapter at gmail.com and we'll send you the bingo card and instructions. And you basically just do the activities um, that are called for each bingo tile. And when you get five tiles in a row or diagonal, you win bingo, and then you'll be entered into a raffle to win prizes. So we hope that you guys want to play along. It's been a lot of fun so far. You can check it out on the Redbud Chapter forum page. Thanks again. That's all I got. And hmm? ah, yes. Um, so. This program will be available online, as will all of the ones that we're doing. Um, our next one coming up is September 2nd, and it's going to be Cynthia Powell of Calflora talking about the amazing resource that Calflora is in terms of all kinds of different ways to find out more about native and non-native plants in California, um, different maps and so on and so forth, and, and will be very interesting. So that's Saturday, excuse me, Wednesday night, September 7th, 7th. September, I can't talk anymore. September 2nd at 7. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, you guys. That was fun.